All right. Um, morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining this webinar today. Um, folks are still trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Kathy Kunkel. I'm an energy finance analyst with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, IEFA. Um, IEFA has been involved in efforts to reform Puerto Rico's electrical system since 2015. And today we are very excited to be hosting this webinar uh, to present the results of comprehensive grid modeling studies uh, that show that a resilient and renewable energy-based power system in Puerto Rico uh, is achievable and affordable um, and can be done without additional investment in new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, these studies come at a critical time as Puerto Rico is making decisions about how to invest billions of dollars in FEMA funds for the electrical system over the coming decade. Um, today, you're gonna hear from the authors of these grid modeling studies and from Ingrid Vila, uh, AIFA board member and president of Cambio Puerto Rico, uh, which coordinated this work. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, and after the presentation, I will moderate uh, a Q&A if you have questions um, during the presentations, feel free to type them into the chat and we will get to them uh, after the presentation. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Ingrid. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you all for joining us today as we present the results of the Puerto Rico Distributed Energy Resource Integration Study, uh, which we have been working on for the past year. I would first like to introduce the team, uh, Derek Stenslick and Matt Richwine from Telos, who have been working on the generation and transmission portion of the modeling, Ray Harold from EE Plus conducting distribution modeling work, Anna Summer from Energy Futures Group, who developed the energy efficiency and cost estimating components, Professor Agustin Irizarri from UPR Mayagüez, who I hope is able to join us a little bit later today, um, and who served as overall advisor, and uh, Kathy Kunkel, energy analyst for AIFA, whom you've already met. Um, we have been able to develop this work thanks to a grant Cambio received from Filantropia Puerto Rico, and we obviously appreciate AIFA's collaboration in setting up this webinar. Next. I want to start by providing a brief background of where this project derives from and the objectives that drive it. In 2018, a multi-sectoral group comprised of labor, community, environmental groups, and experts presented the Queremos Sol proposal as a preferred route for PREPA's transformation towards a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable electric system. As it relates to this modeling work, Queremos Sol transformation is driven by efficiency, conservation and demand management, distributed renewable generation with storage, emphasizing rooftop solar, accelerated the phase out of fossil fuels, and transforming PREPA as a public utility. So it proposes a decentralized energy system that allows individuals, communities, and businesses to play an active role with PREPA support and leadership as a public utility. Queremos Sol seeks to achieve a 25% energy efficiency by 2035 and a minimum 50% renewable uh, generation by 2035 and 100% by 2050. As part of our effort to further develop Queremos Sol, we decided it would be of value to model our proposal so as to demonstrate its potential and its viability. Next. It is important to also briefly review the context under which this project was developed. On the one hand, the impact of natural events such as Hurricane Maria in 2017 and the earthquakes of 2020 highlighted the vulnerability of the current electric system and its consequences, claiming lives and billions of dollars in losses. On the other hand, a system that is dependent on fossil fuels that only contaminate, but leave us with a at the mercy of fluctuations in fossil fuel market prices beyond our control. And obviously PREPA, who despite the above, insists on a centralized system based on fossil fuel. And we know obviously that insisting on the same, we cannot be expecting different results. Um, and evincing great discrepancy between the pro-renewable discourse adopted and its actions. The most recent example of this is a 10 year infrastructure plan that PREPA submitted to FEMA which allocates zero dollars for renewables and billions for transmission and hardening and fossil fuels. Next. So to conduct the study, we use data provided by PREPA that we obtained through a court proceeding. 
We developed it with the assistance of a great team of experts whom I've already introduced and who combined provide the needed knowledge and capacity to model this radically different energy mix. We incorporated a participatory process that allowed Queremos Sol members to provide insight and feedback as well as uh, PREPA, whom we met on uh, several occasions uh, as we were developing the process and incorporated recommendations made by them. So what did we set out to do when we initiated this work? Next. Um, well, first of all, we wanted to uh, demonstrate and, and provide and show uh, what this radically different energy mix would look like. Um, and we wanted to incorporate, obviously, and, and make sure that we would be providing a reliable and resilient system and that we would be able to also model the opportunities and challenges um, and be able to present mitigations for those challenges. Next. And we are enthused with the results that show that the Caremosol approach is a viable and cost-effective alternative that allows objectives to be met, ensuring affordability, service reliability, efficiency in the use of local renewable resources, and resiliency for homes and businesses. Next. And although the Queremos Sol objective for 2035 is to attain 50% renewable generation, the team actually modeled three scenarios plus a base case reaching up to 75% renewable energy in 15 years. The 25% scenario integrates 50% resilient homes. And it's important to know that for Queremos Sol, renewable portfolio standard is not just about doing the right thing for the environment, but given Puerto Rico's solar resource, it also represents the opportunity to provide much needed resiliency to homes and communities. So the study integrates renewables through 2.7 kilowatt rooftop PV systems and 12.6 kilowatt hour uh, storage to address critical loads at the residential level and provide resiliency in case of grid interruption. In scenario two, the team modeled 50% renewable generation with 75% resilient homes, which as I, I mentioned before is the Queremos Sol target. But we decided to push the bar a bit further and model 75% renewables with 100% resilient homes. 100% resilient home translates to a million homes with PV systems and storage as described before. At the 75% renewable uh, scenario, more than half of the capacity is provided by residential rooftop solar and the rest is provided by PV systems and storage at commercial facilities using roofs and parking lots. And now I pass it on to Derek so he can dive into the modeling details. Great, thank you, Ingrid. And next slide, please. So uh, this slide really shows the overview of the technical analysis we, we took as a team to evaluate this radically different resource mix on the Puerto Rico grid. Uh, and it also follows the, the, the way this presentation is gonna go for the next uh, several minutes in the different presenters. We started with a generation analysis using Plexos, went into a transmission analysis in PSSC that looked at load flows and stability of the transmission system, then distribution analysis of the uh, circuits across the island, the distribution circuits, and finally wrapped up with an economic analysis to look at the costs and benefits of this type of uh, grid system that we're proposing or, or evaluating here. I will note the important thing about this slide is we're using the same tools and methods that are really used throughout uh, the power industry at a very highly detailed and technical level. So this was not a back of the envelope analysis. This was using very similar tools, methods, and uh, process and, and modeling techniques that are really used by utilities and grid planners uh, around the world. And so what I'll do is start, start the presentation off with the generation analysis that use Plexus to evaluate grid operations on an hourly and, and sub hourly basis across an entire year of operation and looked at how uh, introducing variable renewables uh, like distributed solar, as well as uh, energy storage actually looks at operating the system with that portfolio mix. Next slide, please. 
So just to give you an overview, In Ingrid gave the high level overview of the different scenarios we evaluated. I wanted to show what that actually looks like on the Puerto Rico system. So here you can see the installed capacity for each of those scenarios and looking not just at the DER additions, but now looking at what that means for the overall portfolio of resources on the island. Uh, there's two sets of bar charts on the right hand side of this figure. The top one shows installed capacity in megawatts. So you see the uh, orange and pink bars, which represent the DER solar and storage increasing dramatically uh, out to the 75% DER scenario. And then you'll also see retirements of some of the fossil fleet, namely the AES coal plant and some of these uh, older steam oil units. Uh, same data is represented on the bottom bar chart, this time as a percentage of the total capacity as a, uh, uh, to show the overall relative makeup of the different resource mix. Again, this is all inputs into the model, just looking at what these portfolios look like on the system. Uh, the table on the left hand, uh, the bottom left shows the retirement assumptions. Uh, and so we looked at not only adding DER uh, to provide energy and grid services, but also to help enable the retirement of some of the older fossil units. And so you can see as the DER increases, there is a retirement in the older uh, coal and steam oil fleet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, the last slide showed the inputs into the model, which is installed capacity. Uh, this slide shows the annual gen net generation uh, of the resources. And so this is showing across an entire year of operation what resources are producing the energy uh, on aggregate for the entire year. So again, the bar chart on the left shows annual generation by resource type. And as the DER increases uh, from the 25% to 75% scenarios, you can see where the displacement uh, takes place. So uh, namely in the first scenario with the retirement of the AES coal plant, the bottom dark gray portion of that, uh, that bar chart, that is retired, so a lot of that energy is displaced by a combination of the DER as well as the remaining steam uh, natural gas fleet and combined cycle gas fleet. And as you push, as we push forward to the 50% and 75% DER scenarios, you can see a few things occurring. One is the solar starts to displace the more expensive steam oil generation on the system and uh, the combined cycle LNG uh, facilities remain and combined cycle oil uh, facilities, the most efficient generation, uh, fossil generation on the system, those remain a, a, a portion of the overall resource mix, even in that 75% DER scenario. So you can see what, what that DER enables is uh, displacement of the higher cost generation, the oil fired uh, steam units that are most expensive to operate. Chart on the right shows again the same data, but now just looking at the changes that are occurring. So the displacement across each of those scenarios, uh, walking through much of what I just discussed. So the right hand portion of that chart is increases in generation for that scenario relative to the base case. The left hand side shows displacement. So what is getting uh, taken off of the system. And you can also see I, I flagged the carbon reduction uh, that's achieved by these scenarios. So in the 25% DER scenario, you can see a 35% reduction in uh, annual CO2 emissions. And the reason uh, that's higher than some of the, uh, on a per unit basis is because again, we targeted that AES coal retirement first. And then as the DER increases, you can see uh, we reach 70% reduction in CO2 emissions annually with that scenario. Next slide, please. Now, obviously very important for grid operations and reliability is not just looking at the annual numbers, but looking at grid operations on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour, and even on a sub-hourly basis. And so to do that, we performed uh, the production cost analysis for an entire year of operation and looked at how the variations in the solar profile uh, occurred over the course of the year as well as scheduling of the storage resources to displace uh, not only midday generation, but also evening and overnight periods. And so this is one representative day. Again, we replicated this across the entire year, but you can see the 
the average daily generation profile in the current case, very minimal uh, solar kind of shaving off some of the peak load in the middle of the day. And then as we increase the DER, it's pushing down the fossil in the middle of the day with some of the solar going onto the grid. The remainder, uh, the area over that load curve, that's what's going into the batteries, charging into the batteries, and then later discharging in the evening and overnight periods. Uh, the other thing you can notice from this chart is you, you can recognize the rest of the fossil fleet remains fairly uh, level loaded and doesn't have to fluctuate much as the uh, increase of uh, DER. And that's because much of the load following is being uh, taken into account by the, the distributed battery storage systems. And so you can see in general overall leveling of uh, the fossil fleet generation uh, other than this evening uh, ramp up at the end of the day. Now you can also see in the 75% case in the middle of the day, you can see very little fossil generation online. And we'll get into that much more in much more detail coming up. But that's something we also wanted to evaluate is at really high penetration. What does that mean for grid stability and, and grid operations? So next slide, please. Another thing we looked at, uh, again, the production cost analysis was a full nodal representation of the Puerto Rico transmission system. So we evaluated each of the transmission lines on the Puerto Rico grid. We cited the uh, DER at the loads. And so that is a benefit of distributed energy resources in general is it's of course cited at the distribution level right directly at the loads. And so what that means is there's less reliance on the overall transmission network to transfer power from one region of Puerto Rico to another. And so currently on today's system, much of the generation is located on the south uh, portion of the island, specifically in Ponce Este and Ponce Oeste. And so you can see those are areas in today's system, the black bar, have positive net flow. So that is a net supply region that is uh, pushing power to the other regions of Puerto Rico, which are all negative. And you can see that those are net importing regions, if you will. And so they're uh, on net receiving electricity from the Ponce regions where most of that fossil generation is located. Uh, but the important trend here is as the DER is added to the system, it's located at the load. And so in general, what you see is a leveling across the board where there's less generation on net coming out of the Ponce region. Uh, and each of the importing regions become uh, import less energy. And even in San Juan, which is the load center where most of this distributed energy resources is going along with Biomon, uh, actually becomes a net supply region in and of itself. And so that's a very important trend. So essentially there's less reliance on Southern uh, generation. There's less reliance on the transmission network overall. And there's system-wide reliability benefits because of that, let alone the, uh, the individual DER reliability and resiliency benefit. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, I touched on the uh, previously uh, the carbon emission reductions. We also calculated the total production cost reductions. And so here production cost is a combination of fuel costs, uh, variable operations and maintenance costs and startup and shutdown costs. This is an important metric because this is the avoided cost of new uh, of the DER generation. Uh, so we're showing between $100 million and $600 million of avoided, essentially avoided fuel cost uh, savings. Now these are not net savings. This is the avoided fuel cost. Obviously a portion of these save fuel savings or all of it would have to go to offset the cost of the new DER. And so that's something we will, uh, uh, Anna will touch on later in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. And I mentioned this uh, previously, but want to come back to it as a segue into the transmission analysis. Again, not only did we look at hour by hour uh, operations of the grid, but in particular, we were interested in uh, these periods of very high variable renewable 
uh, penetration or periods of time when most of the generation on the island was coming from inverter-based resources. That has very important implications for grid stability. And so that was a key focus of this study. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Matt Richwine, who uh, will go through the transmission stability work. Hi, thanks, Derek. And, and just to pick up on this slide, you know, the, the grid stability challenges that we're looking at are dynamic events that happen over the course of a few seconds. And it, it looks to say, if there's a large disturbance on the grid, um, how does the grid recover from that? And also a note, given that we are pushing the grid and, and modeling the grid uh, into very high levels of renewable penetration, places where few grids have gone before and where studies are, are, are still um, being worked out, there are also tool challenges in addition to the real world challenges of, of making a system work like that. And so I think it's important to and wanted to acknowledge that not only are we challenged in terms of getting the system to work, but we're also challenged in terms of studying the system and, um, and to be cognizant of that. So on the next slide, we'll get into the different types of dynamic disturbances we looked at. We, we looked at two broad categories of disturbances or contingencies, the first being generation contingencies and the second being transmission contingencies. So on the top with generation contingencies, we consider the loss of the single largest or, or highest dispatch unit at a given grid condition um, based on, on the results from the operations analysis that Derek was describing. Uh, we did not consider multiple units simultaneously. Um, and, and one note, you know, that um, Eco Electrica is a bit of a special case in that the plant is connected to the rest of the grid versus um, via one transmission line. Um, we only considered Eco Electrica in a loss of one of the units, not a loss of the entire plant. All of the contingencies, or actually a subset of the contingencies that we looked at, are summarized in the table on the right where for each scenario uh, shown in columns going across, you can see the largest conventional units online and what their dispatch was at the time with the text in red being uh, the megawatt level of dispatch that was evaluated. Um, so some of the units having very high levels of dispatch uh, power production with respect to the total load on the island, uh, meaning it's a relatively severe event that we're looking at. On the transmission contingency side on the bottom, uh, you can see a table. We looked at six different line outages. Um, this is where there would be a, a considered a fault or a short circuit on that transmission line in the island. And subsequently, the protection systems on the island would suddenly remove that transmission line uh, from serve to clear the fault, um, leaving the grid to operate with one transmission line down. Uh, the transmission lines considered are also shown graphically on the, on the map, where we're looking at the major paths, the red lines being the 230 kV or the highest voltage level on the island, um, including a double circuit um, contingency, as well as a couple 115 kV contingencies uh, shown in yellow. This was also, we, uh, we presented and, and spoke with the PREPA engineering team who provided some feedback and um, to add the 115 kV contingencies actually and, um, and agree that those are some of the most critical transmission contingencies for dynamic stability. So on the next slide, I'd like to highlight um, the results of the dynamic stability cases from the loss of generation event and particular, um, in particular to highlight one of the mitigations that we found in this study um, that was particularly effective. One of the, the challenges is operating in low inertia. And what that means is conventionally um, synchronous machine power plants, so your um, coal, oil, gas fired and power plants all have rotating machinery, which provides inertia to the system. And essentially that means that it slows the rate of the response of the system down when there's a sudden event that starts the grid moving. And so by having more inertia on the system, you have more time to respond. 
And by having less inertia or, or fewer of those conventional units online connected to the system, the grid starts moving faster and dynamic stability can be more challenging to maintain. What, um, in order to illustrate this and show, if you look on the right, uh, there are two traces and we'll just focus first on the blue dotted trace. This is one of the challenging scenarios were studied where there was a sudden loss of generation, which sends frequency down from 60 Hertz um, and, and plummeting quite quickly over the span of a handful of seconds. And you can see that that dotted blue trace goes down and continues going down and essentially indicates a loss of stability of the grid and a, a grid wide blackout. Now that is due to the, the grid was attempting to recover Cover, but could not recover in the time required given the system condition. What we applied here was what we call fast frequency response or FFR. And what this is, is a service that can be applied at the distributed resources um, across the grid where all of these resources are, are watching system frequency for a sudden event like this. And if they detect an event, they're able to quickly respond by injecting power and helping support the grid. The sensitivity that we're showing here on the right in the solid blue lines shows the same case with the same loss of generation contingency simulated, but now with FFR applied across the DERs on the grid. And you can see that frequency initially goes down as would be expected for any event like this, but then it quickly stabilizes around to just slightly above 59 Hertz. And you can see the power response from the DER and the bottom trace ramps up very quickly over the course of seven, several seconds and actually avoids under frequency load shedding in, in this particular case and in many cases um, so that not only are you able to avoid a system blackout, but you're able to avoid the loss of, uh, the loss of a good bit of load that's usually accompanied um, with such a severe dis disturbance like this. So in terms of the DER, this is often discussed as frequency watt response or one of the smart inverter functions. Um, this is a commercial avail this is a commercially available um, option now on modern DER. And it is capable of providing it such as long as the DER is, I would say, pre-positioned to respond, to have some headroom both in power and in energy, such that if there is an event, there is some capability in the DER across the grid to respond quickly and help stabilize the grid. On the next slide, I'd like to talk about um, a little bit more on the very high instantaneous renewables penetrations. So uh, Derek at the end of his slide discussed and showed some duration curves showing that there are many hours and particularly in the 75% scenario, over 3000 hours where there are very few conventional plants online. This poses a, a severe risk to grid stability for today's inverter technology. Um, the, and as well as I had mentioned, the simulation and analytical tools for operating grids with so with such an inverter dominant um, operation or characteristic is also challenged. But that's not to say that it cannot be done uh, and cannot be analyzed. Um, for this, we were using the PSSC software, which is the same software that PREPA uses and, and many, um, many operators across North America use. But there are some known limitations when you get into these very high instantaneous renewable penetrations. And there are another set of tools that can be done on that have higher fidelity models of the system that are designed and intended for looking at these particular cases. Beyond the analytical challenges, there are also the challenges of making this work. And, and there are generally two approaches. Um, one is there's an emerged technology, an emerging inverter technology often referred to in the industry as grid forming technology. Um, this technology is currently in its infancy, um, but there are some studies that are showing some promise for this in which the inverters, in short, they behave a little bit more like conventional power plants. 
and can provide some of those stabilizing grid services. The other approach for mitigating this is to use the, the types of technologies that have been proven and demonstrated for a long time. Um, the, so in short, a synchronous condenser, which is the generator end of a conventional power plant, um, can be used online without a turbine on, on the other end. So it's not, it's not consuming fuel or burning fuel. It's also not providing energy to the grid. But when it is connected, it is providing valuable grid services in terms of the inertia that we've discussed, as well as grid strength, which is important for other types of contingencies like the transmission contingencies I described. And a, a different flavor of the synchronous condenser operation uh, synchronous condenser approach is changing grid operations to make sure that there's a, a certain number of must run units into the system so that you have enough of those grid services from the conventional fleet to support grid operations we know them today. On that, I'd like to, to transition over to Ray on the distribution analysis. Matt, next slide, please. All right, let me start out. Uh, I just want to talk, whoops, that's a little too far. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the scope of what we did, how we did it, and the results that we obtained. Um, one more forward, please. All right, great, thank you. Um, there are approximately 1,100 uh, distribution circuits within the Puerto Rican system or the PREPA system. Um, PREPA provided us from their synergy models uh, seven representative feeders. Um, and based on uh, what we were trying to do, we did not feel that seven feeders were going to be a sufficient uh, sample to uh, to perform any uh, legitimate analysis. So um, in the absence of the remainder of the feeders from PREPA, they did provide us a very robust GIS uh, data download. And so we used that GIS data to prepare open DSS models that represented almost 90% of the feeders, um, about 900 or so uh, uh, of the total 1,100 feeders and around 28, 29,000 uh, line miles of the 31,000 or so line miles that are on uh, the main island and the, the two corresponding, Vieques and Culebra. Um, so we, we turned uh, their GIS data into distribution models that we could use to perform the distribution analysis um, of various penetration levels of, of solar and battery. Uh, next slide, please. So um, how did we go about that? Well, we, we looked at each and every feeder and we did an allocation uh, of the PV and battery systems onto each feeder geospatially along the feeder based on the location of the distribution transformers. The GIS model had a geospatial representation of the size and location Uh, essentially every transformer, distribution level transformer uh, on the PREPA distribution system. So the, the logic kind of went like, we, we know that where there is a distribution transformer, there is likely to be a load of some form or fashion. We surmised or made the assumption that where there were single phase distribution transformers, there would probably be uh, residential homes. So we allocate 
aided uh, the residential PV and battery systems um, to the locations where there were single phase distribution transformers. And we scaled them or allocated them based on the size of those distribution transformers. That is, if there's a large transformer that re is representative in, like, in all likelihood of multiple homes or a large apartment complex or something along those lines. Where there were three phase distribution transformers, we made the assumption that that would likely be a commercial facility. That's not gonna be the case in every uh, situation, but it was a simplifying assumption that we made to, to get the PV and DER or PV and battery systems geospatially distribute out, distributed out amongst, uh, out along the feeders. So uh, that was basically how we installed that. The demand on each feeder was then on an hourly basis, uh, an 8760 basis, was coordinated with the uh, with the transmission modeling that uh, Derek referred to uh, earlier done in Plexus. So that defined how much load was on each one of the feeders uh, at any given time. And then the, the allocation method that I just described said, this is where the, uh, the PV and battery systems are going to be put and how, how big they're going to be and what their characteristic is going to be, whether it's going to be residential or commercial. Next slide, please. When we started doing the analysis, we looked at um, principally thermal and voltage violations. We didn't look at stability. Um, distribution stabi st stability uh, is not really the same issue as Matthew just de defined. Um, there are things like flicker voltage and things along those lines. We didn't go far, that far down into, into those issues. We look strictly at impacity and uh, meeting the voltage criteria of PREPA. So we looked at um, either performing line upgrades as necessary to mitigate those violations or potentially upgrading substation transformers. And when we looked at the mitigation, rather than doing this incrementally for 25%, 50%, and 75%, because this is going to be a relatively large infrastructure uh, investment, we said, okay, if we're going to make the investment, we're going to do whatever is necessary to ultimately reach a 75% DER penetration level. So we didn't do the incremental steps along the way. We ultimately just said, if we're going to upgrade it, we're going to upgrade it to meet the requirements of the 75% penetration level. And the way we kind of define the line upgrades or the mitigation techniques were as follows. If a conductor size didn't have to increase any more than a, than a couple of conductor sizes, we said that line could be reconductor. That is the physical infrastructure of the distribution system could accommodate a slightly larger conductor size. If on the other hand, it had to be more than two conductor sizes, we were going to have to rebuild that entire line. There's a difference in, in cost, a pretty appreciable difference in cost associated with those two scenarios. Uh, for transformer upgrades, primarily substation transformer upgrades, because we didn't really look at the individual distribution transformers in terms of upgrading those individual ones. Um, because if they're serving load now, they should be able to serve load um, once, once the DER is in place. So we look primarily at uh, substation transformers to understand if there were reverse power flow uh, overloads associated with them. And we, we kind of arbitrarily said that um, if the overloads, reverse power overloads are not more than 125% for any longer than 500 hours annually, uh, most transformers can accommodate that. If on the other hand, it's greater than 125% or the overloads are more than 500 hours annually, we're going to have to do some level of replacement. Next slide, please. Now, what did we find out? Um, 
we were actually pleasantly surprised. When I went into this, uh, I was anticipating that as a bare minimum to reach a 75% uh, upgrade scenario, we were probably going to have to improve at least 30, if not 40, or even perhaps more uh, percent of the, uh, of the overall distribution infrastructure. That was based on previous experience where we were installing relatively large penetrations, but at lumped locations. By distributing uh, the DER in the fashion that we did, um, the amount of infrastructure repair, mitigation, however you want to characterize it, was substantially lower than I initially expected. We were getting values between 15 and 20 percent, uh, much, much lower than I originally um, anticipated. And you'll see that because, again, we're not, uh, we're not really moving a lot of power per say we're in the transformer upgrades, substation transformer upgrades were extremely mo modest, maybe 4% of the total the uh, total installed capacity. So the, the results in that respect, in terms of the amount of mitigation uh, that was necessary to, to correct the violations that we saw were, were very modest. Um, uh, next slide, please. Let's talk about why we think that actually is. As I said before, my previous experience with doing a high penetration, particularly on, in, in island systems, uh, where you will only have a modest amount of uh, fossil fuel generation, and, and you're coming in and putting in a relatively large solar penetration, you get all kinds uh, of issues associated with that. And, and one of the primary ones is you're moving a lot of power on the distribution system that it really wasn't necessarily designed to do. Using the strategy that was pursued here, that is putting the resources where the load is, we minimize the amount of power that actually has to move on the distribution system. Uh, therefore, it's inherently less taxing on the distribution system. There are peak periods where there's a lot of solar activity and not so much load, where there is a little bit of power moving on the distribution system and the upgrades are necessary to accommodate that. But that's, again, much uh, a much smaller problem than we anticipated. And that's largely because of the combination of the PV systems with the battery system. When you're at that low load, high PV scenario, you can use the PV system to charge the batteries, just as uh, Derek's um, graphs generally showed. You can use those PV systems to offset the high voltage that is typically associated uh, with high penetrations of PV systems by charging the batteries. You mitigate some of those uh, voltage issues um, just by, by the very nature of your, your installation. Um, so the, the, the long and short of this is that um, this isn't a completely perfect solution in the sense that there are still mitigations that must take place, but by shifting the local demand, by putting the resource where the demand is, we mitigate the, the overall use of the distribution system and we mitigate the inherent problems that typically go along with uh, PV systems when they're applied in this fashion. So it, it's both the location and the nature uh, of the systems that really resulted in the very encouraging results that we wound up with. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anna to kind of discuss the energy economics and the overall uh, cost of the mitigation that I've just discussed. Thank you, Ray. Next slide, please. I want to touch first on how we estimated load in 2020, 2035. Um, we started first with uh, an estimated 2020 load number and then um, developed a top-down um, methodology that wanted to examine what it would take to get to the Karimoso goal of a 25% reduction 
in energy consumption in 15 years. Um, we allocated um, our 2020 load by customer class and by end use type. And then we made projections using both EIA data as well as data um, from our own um, work uh, implementing energy efficiency programs around the country to come up with a total projected load in 2035 of 11,736 gigawatt hours. Next slide, please. We also wanted to make sure that the PV and the battery storage costs that we used in this study were reflective of conditions in Puerto Rico. There's um, a good, you know, healthy amount of data um, that I think is more reflective of mainland prices and not necessarily reflective of Puerto Rico conditions. So we sought um, estimates of PV and BESS costs uh, that were specific to Puerto Rico and we're able to use that data as our 2020 starting point. Um, acknowledging that those costs are likely to come down in the future, we then applied um, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's ATB cost decline curves uh, so that we could account for the fact that the installations of these systems would occur um, throughout the period from 2020 to 2035. Next slide, please. What we ended up with is shown here in the graph on the right. Um, we have a total system cost for the base case, the 25%, 50%, 75% DER scenarios um, by, by cost component. The 75% DER scenario is approximately $500 million cheaper than the base case. And the base case is essentially the system that Puerto Rico has right now with no new investment in any type of uh, additional generations just operating the system that exists um, today. Um, this uh, graph is conservative for a number of reasons. One is that we assumed because we lacked better data that only 170 megawatts of distributed solar PV is installed in Puerto Rico today. And we also assumed that none of that um, distributed PV has any battery storage attached to it. And then battery storage, as you can tell from this graph, is one of the largest cost components of, um, of each one of the DER scenarios. Um, in addition, a third conservatism of this analysis is that um, we are assuming that uh, Puerto Rican ratepayers have to pay for the entire capital cost of these investments. So there's no buy down, so to speak, um, from any sort of federal funds accounted for in this graph. Next slide, please. We did, however, wanna look at this from a rate perspective also. Um, so again, the, the three bars on the left reflect the total, the, the average rate of each one of the DER scenarios, um, assuming that there is no federal funding coming to help pay for um, uh, DPV and, and, and distributed BESS. Um, however, well, the reality is that those funds now exist and they can be used um, to, to pay for these systems. Um, so we, we assume that a, a majority of FEMA 404, 428 and HUD funds could be used um, to help us achieve the 75% DER scenario. And when you do that, um, average rates in 2035 would be approximately 15 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which is a market decrease from the fiscal year 2019 rate of 21 cents per kilowatt hour. Next slide, please. We also wanted to compare this to PREPA's ESM. And I recognize that this is not the uh, plan that was approved by the Bureau uh, in its IRP order. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, um, we wanted to make this comparison for a number of reasons. One is that the 10 year fiscal, I'm sorry, the 10 year infrastructure plan proposed by PREPA has a lot of similarities to the ESM. Um, there are billions of dollars in there in transmission distribution expenditures and expenditures for new fossil um, based uh, generation. And in that way, it's very different than, from what the, um, the Bureau ordered in its IRP order. Um, so when you compare the ESM plan to the DER scenarios, uh, you can see that the total capital investment under the ESM is much higher, approximately $5 billion higher than even the 75% DER scenario. And if you divide those expenditures between transmission on the bottom left and generation on the bottom right, you can see part of the, what drives that difference. Um, the ESM plan and the current sort of mini grid proposal that um, PREPA is, is um, advocating for um, spends billions of dollars on T&D investment. Um, this, this estimate here, the, the gray bar on the bottom left graph, assumes about uh, $5 billion worth of investment in the mini-grid mini concept. Um, but PREPA's most recent um, data response to the Bureau 
now puts that estimate at about $8.5 billion um, with a range of uncertainty of uh, negative 50% to 100% um, higher than that estimate. Um, so we're really, at, we are talking about a concentration of investment into capital to, um, to, to install, you know, fuelless uh, DPV and distributed battery storage, which is very different than what has been proposed so far. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just, I already touched on some of these items, um, but the, currently uh, the 10 year infrastructure plan has $8.4 billion in funds dedicated to transmission and distribution infrastructure. And again, a lot of that is driven by um, uh, an emphasis on the mini grid concept and emphasis on hardening um, the distribution transmission system so that you can retain the centralized structure that, that Puerto Rico has right now. Um, the 75% DER scenario um, has approximately uh, $650 million allocated toward distribution costs and approximately $9 billion overall um, in investment for distributed uh, renewable and battery storage. And again, that's assuming these conservatisms about um, the existing DPV and distributed storage that um, exists on the system today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ingrid. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next. So when we look at the overall of what has been discussed today in the modeling work, um, and some of these conclusions have uh, been touched by uh, the various presenters. First of all, we have a, a renewable energy penetration model that is feasible and that requires modest improvements to the distribution system. Very importantly, it is a resilient model. Uh, it provides equipping a million homes in Puerto Rico with rooftop solar and battery backup. And that adds 2,700 megawatts of power to the grid, uh, which is then complemented by commercial renewable generation to attain the 75% renewable energy penetration. That implies that in 15 years, resiliency conditions in Puerto Rico could be dramatically different. It is also important to note that there is no fossil fuel investment required. And the study demonstrate that there is no need for this or for conversion of existing plants and that uh, fossil fuel phase out uh, can be started as early as the 25% renewable scenario and the vast majority of PREPA's current generation fleet at the 75% would no longer be used, including the AES coal plants. Um, it would obviously reduce dependency on transmission. And um, as we have learned uh, from past experiences, this is obviously a recognized vulnerability of our system. So reducing dependency on transmission uh, automatically reduces uh, vulnerability as well. Next slide, please. There is also important uh, contributions in terms of improving um, uh, climate change contributions from Puerto Rico. Uh, and we present 70% 70 70 reductions of CO2 emissions in the 75% scenario. And this is significant progress uh, for environmental and health conditions for communities. And it also positions Puerto Rico at the forefront of addressing climate change with urgency. Um, as Anna was mentioning, the 75% scenario is less expensive than the current grid. It reduces important fossil fuel costs by nearly 600 million relative to the current generation system. And uh, obviously it becomes even more affordable if Perepa can purchase the equipment and install with employees supplementing with local contractors as needed. Um, and system costs also, as Anna mentioned, uh, fall be, uh, below 20 cents per kilowatt hour in the 50 and 75% scenarios. Um, as we know, Puerto Rico's uh, future electric rates uh, face significant uncertainty um, because of debt, but also because of the continued dependency on fossil fuels. Um, just last week, it was announced that uh, rates will be increasing as of April, probably, uh, because of increase, increase on uh, fossil fuel prices. Um, thus, uh, this alternative obviously will provide uh, uh, stability and reduce volatility uh, due to rate fluctuations. Um, and system costs would further, uh, would go down further to 15 cents per kilowatt hour if federal funds were injected into this plan. Um, there are $9.65 billion in federal funds available to attain this 75% scenario. Next. Uh, 
And obviously the benefits uh, of the study are, are many, um, not only uh, among the conclusions that I have presented, but the study uh, as such provides new and useful information that can guide the transformation of Puerto Rico's energy model and the use of federal funds. Um, the results show that this transformation is viable, reliable, and cost-effective for citizens, and it's beneficial not only to the economy, but to PREPA. Um, the model also ensures that lower-income communities share in the benefits of renewable energy um, and that no one is left behind. And this alternative um, is in line with the federal government's climate, energy, and economic plan. Next. Um, so, like I mentioned, the distributed energy future uh, is technically achievable, affordable, and would provide real resiliency to Puerto Rico. Um, the study can help inform discussions regarding federal fund investments. It can also aid PREPA in targeting more effectively upgrades needed for solar integration. Um, it can also provide a pathway for maximizing federal funds to ensure risk reduction and vulnerabilities, and it evenly distributes resiliency across the population. And it obviously can launch PREPA as a 21st century utility. Next. And there are important lessons also derived from the study that are applicable beyond Puerto Rico. Um, integrating generation, transmission, and distribution modeling, as has been done here, allows the analysis of scenarios that are typically not included in utility long-term planning analysis. Um, it has also been demonstrated by the study that locating generation and storage at the point of consumption proves to be a cost-effective way uh, to integrate renewables requiring modest upgrades to the distribution system. Um, and resiliency is obviously something that is sought not only in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, but all over the world. So in light of increasing severe storms that affect electric system infrastructure, more attention should be paid to distributed resiliency solutions as developed in the study. Um, in the case of Puerto Rico, costs compare favorably to proposals presented by the government to FEMA uh, to harden the centralized system. Um, and with that, I think we can move over to questions. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much to our panelists today. Um, if you have questions, um, feel free to type them directly in the chat um, and or raise your hand and we can call on you. Um, We've and... got one from Louie, um, first in line, that I don't think you guys are able to see, so I can read it aloud to you. Okay, great. Um, Louis says, or Louis, excuse me, uh, congratulations on this renewable energy penetration. Uh, technical analysis. My question is the following. Have you studied how the utility as an organization, example, management, departments, work, practices, etc., has to change or evolve in order to achieve these goals? I'll paste this in the chat as well so everyone can see it. Um, we did not, obviously, this is a, a modeling study of uh, distributed resources and the integration of renewables. So we didn't go into the, the governance changes that have to happen at PREPA in order to comply with this. Um, having said that though, the Queremos Sol proposal, which I encourage everybody also to get uh, familiarized with, you can access that at www.queremosolpr.com. It does provide for uh, transforming PREPA's administration and PREPA as a public utility in order to be able to uh, implement this sort of uh, uh, renewable integration and uh, this path that we are proposing here. And there's a related question in the chat of how much are PREPA's uh, technical folks familiar with this study? Um, and also how will unionized workers be integrated into the plan? In terms of uh, how familiarized they, they are, um, like uh, Matt mentioned, we, we were able to present uh, the modeling work as we were progressing and receive some feedback from PREPA folks. Um, we also presented results to PREPA prior to making them public. Uh, they also participated yesterday um, in a workshop conducted by the Puerto Rico Energy Bureau in which we also um, presented again 
modeling results. So um, at least within the planning department of PREPA, uh, they are at this point quite familiar with our work and results. Um, regarding uh, PREPA workers, uh, it's important to know that uh, PREPA's labor union, UTIER, is part of the Queremos Sol coalition. So uh, they are very much on board with this transition and with transitioning uh, workers' jobs to uh, renewable energy. Uh, next question is what are the next steps to implement this study? Well, uh, one of our first steps obviously is to, to get the study out there, to get uh, not just general public, but decision makers to uh, learn about the study. And that's what we have been do doing uh, for the past week since we made the results public. Uh, we, we do have plans to continue to present this at other forums. Um, and in order to implement this, like we have mentioned, um, it would be of great benefit to get federal funds to uh, make this project uh, or this plan viable and this proposal viable, uh, not only because of the resiliency benefits, but also, uh, as we have mentioned, it would provide uh, reduced costs and, and more stable rates for the people of Puerto Rico, which is a direct benefit not only to individuals, but also to the economy. Okay, um, we have a couple of technical questions that came in. Um, maybe for Derek or Matt, um, how much curtailment do you forecast of the energy from rooftop solar systems? Yeah, I can take this one. So we saw very little curtailment uh, on the system and actually no curtailment, if I remember correctly, for the 25% and 50% DER scenarios. Uh, there is very marginal curtailment occurring in the 75% DER scenario. Uh, the reason for that is there's a lot of storage going into these systems as well. So we looked at both solar and storage going on to the grid concurrently. And I mean, frankly, an overbuild of storage for just curtailment purposes. So you wouldn't need that much curtail uh, storage to mitigate the curtailment. The storage was really also used not just as a grid resource and a DER grid services, but also for resiliency purposes. And so because of that, we see very little curtailment due to the amount of storage we assumed in the analysis. Great. Um, and then a question, I think, for Ray. Um, could you talk more about how you were able to model the actual power flow from all the feeders with data from only seven feeders provided by PREPA? Well, as I noted, um, we, we actually didn't even use the seven feeders. We, we benchmarked against the seven feeders that they provided, but we actually constructed our own models for... 900 and some feeders from the GIS data using uh, Python code to extract data from the GIS. It was a, a bit of an elaborate process, but uh, we, we didn't model all of this using only those seven feeders. We actually constructed our own models of, of over 900 feeders. Okay, um, and then there's a couple more questions related to uh, governance and uh, market models for the system. Um, one question is what would be sort of the more, more efficient uh, transactive energy model, you know, some form of local markets um, or should PREPA still hold its uh, monopoly over generation transmission and distribution? Um, and then there's a related question if you want to touch on it as to whether or not the Luma contract uh, threatens the fulfillment of this plan. Um, well, addressing the first question, uh, we are assuming that PREPA uses federal funds to uh, implement this model. So that implies that uh, it would be acquiring uh, all these systems and uh, proceeding with installation. So PREPA still has uh, a very important role here, but obviously customers also uh, uh, acquire or an important role in terms of, of having this capacity installed within their households. Um, regarding uh, LUMA, um, yes, we do think that the LUMA contracts represents an obstacle in terms of being able to implement this. Uh, and that's for several reasons. 
Uh, first of all, the LUMA contract, for those who have been able to study it, does not provide specific metrics for LUMA to attain uh, renewable goals. Um, it is uh, indirectly referenced in terms of being or having to comply with law, but there are no specific uh, consequences for LUMA not meeting those RPS goals that have been established uh, by law. Um, and second of all, um, we do know that obviously the entities that comprise LUMA, which are ATCO and Quantas, have indicated their interest uh, to participate directly in the contracting of federal funds and their expertise lies within uh, transmission uh, construction. So um, we do not expect them to, to be emphasizing on this. And I would further add that on two instances now where we have been able to interact with Luma on workshops at the Energy Bureau, they have been very clear on establishing uh, their doubts and, and minimizing the importance of this sort of renewable energy integration and particularly rooftop solar as a method to transform the system. Um, and they have even uh, gone further to even uh, question at some point the value of, of such installations. So um, all, those, uh, indicate, all those are indications that uh, this would not be uh, LUMA's preferred route for investing federal funds or for transforming PREPA. Thank you. Um, our next question is, has this study been shared with FEMA uh, and with CORE 3, which is the Puerto Rico Central Office of Recovery? Um, we have uh, forwarded the study to FEMA personnel and to CORE 3 personnel, as well as DOE. Um, we are awaiting response and hopefully we'll be able to coordinate uh, a meeting and a presentation with them as well. Um, great, and then uh, is there a plan to survey people of Puerto Rico to see how willing they are to have solar panels installed on rooftops? Um, I think that would be an interesting uh, uh, project to engage in. Um, I think in the past, though, there have been informal um, uh, measurements of how people feel about uh, renewables, particularly after Maria. And I think there is a, a homogeneous response from the people of Puerto Rico that see this as a sustainable and as a preferred pass, path for Puerto Rico. And I think um, in, in many ways, that is uh, what is reflected in the law, in Law 17. Um, and that is also what has been reflected in the IRP uh, recently approved by the Bureau. All right, and then um, again, related to governance, as we adopt these distributed versions of the Puerto Rico electrical system, stakeholders and communities will have to develop active participation processes for energy decision-making at multiple levels. How do you see that governance transition occurring? That is going to be key and very important. Um, and that's why um, in the, within the Caramoso proposal, education is one of the main pillars um, because we do have to increase capacity within communities, even within the business sector, um, to, so that they know uh, what their role is going to be, how their role changes from a passive client to an active prosumer. Um, so definitely um, capacity building is key in order uh, for this transition and for governors to be implemented uh, adequately. Great, and I think our last question um, from the outside, I mean, this might be a question for Anna. Um, from the outside, it's confusing and hard to reconcile projections from Puerto Rico or from PREPA's IRP uh, and announcements from both PREPA and the Energy Bureau regarding uh, PV and storage. Um, can you help reconcile and put that in context? Um, if the question relates to just the volume of PV and storage that's in the different plans, um, I agree that that is hard to reconcile. Um, we used the work papers from the, the, that had been part of the um, uh, of PREPA's filing with the Bureau as part of the IRP to try and understand what the total capital investment in it it was on the generation side for PV and battery storage specifically. Um, and we've done some reconciliation of that proposal with what the Energy Bureau approved. And we're hoping to file that in the mini grid optimization docket um, in response to questions that the Bureau 
has either posted or is, is will be posting soon. Um, so uh, I would say it's complicated, but um, hopefully uh, the combination of the report, reading the report that um, we wrote for this study and looking at the response to those questions will help um, answer that. Great. Um, well, I think that is all of the questions um, that we have. Oh, wait, there might be one, might be one more. So a follow-up for Ray. Um, could you please clarify what data was used for your model of power flow of the feeders? Um, well, okay. The, the data that was used was from the GIS system. And what, what we used were the conductor types, the transformer sizes, um, the topology of the circuit as, as was promulgated by the GIS system. Uh, we used the source impedances associated with the transmission buses that were provided by Matt. We used the substation transformer sizes and impedance. There were uh, there was a plethora of, of data that was actually used there, but it was kind of the standard set of data that would typically be used for uh, the construction of any distribution model. It's just the way that we went about it was a little unconventional. All right, thank you for that clarification, Ray. Um, and with that, I believe there are no more questions. I want to thank everyone, uh, including our panelists, uh, for participating today. Um, oh, and we want to take a final question here. What is the position of uh, panelists regarding large-scale PV uh, and storage? Uh, large, well, yeah, large-scale solar and storage. I mean, the, the modeling work follows the Queremos Sol proposal. Um, and the Queremos Sol proposal focuses on rooftop solar um, as the preferred route and discourages large scale utility, particularly because of impacts on agricultural lands or ecologically sensitive areas. The study does integrate though, um, larger scale applications at commercial facilities using their roofs and parking lots. Uh, but that is the focus of the study. And like I mentioned, it, it follows the Queremos Sol proposal. All right, great. Well, I think that's a good note to end on here. I appreciate everyone staying uh, a bit past the hour to, uh, to answer these questions and as I said earlier, this webinar uh, has been recorded um, and will be available through AIFA's website. Um, thank you all again for uh, participating and attending and to all of our panelists today. Thank you, Kathy.